Yeah. Uh, I'm going to uh, kick us into uh, retirement and insurance plans. Um, the SECURE Act that was passed at the end of the year uh, did a lot of uh, work changing retirement plan arrangements. Um, and in fact, there are uh, third party administrators out there doing um, hour long or, or longer webinars on this very subject because there, it's a, there are a considerable number of changes, there are a considerable number of options, some are mandated, uh, the phase in dates for, for some of the, the changes are different. Uh, so I will tell you that our plan is to, to look at the um, act itself in, in the context of our plan, decide what we think we like decide what we think we don't like, and then invite our TPA in to, to uh, and ask questions of them and, and get some clarification before um, the implementation dates arise. So my tax tip would be to uh, look very carefully if you have a 401k plan um, at uh, what the changes are and reach some preliminary conclusions and then have a meeting with your advisors to sort out just what it means uh, for your organization, especially when it comes to uh, the administrative challenges of implementing some of this stuff. So uh, some of the new rules for retirement plans, um, if you're a new plan, you're going to be faced with auto enrollment. Um, and if you were uh, prior to, to certain dates, uh, the, the date of this tax act, I think you're exempted, which is a blessing uh, for existing plans. Um, you also will be faced with auto escalation so that your uh, em employee contributions will ramp up uh, to as high as 10% uh, at some point. And, uh, you know, the employees obviously can opt out, but uh, you're going to be faced with auto changing uh, their deductions and then dealing with the administrative headache of changing them back if they don't like them. And that's something that we've steadfastly resisted, the, both the auto enrollment and the auto escalation. And my hope is that um, as a plan that uh, might be exempted because of the date that we created it, uh, we'll be able to continue to avoid that. But that's uh, an administrative headache for your employee or for your uh, payroll department. Uh, they've also uh, made it possible for employers uh, to elect to match student loan repayments at the same rate as elective deferrals. Uh, there's a lot of nuances here, and, and you have to look long and hard and see if you really want to allow that. Uh, there's a, a great push on to uh, provide some relief uh, to a younger workforce uh, on the student loan question. Uh, there was uh, forgiveness at the federal level. There are forgiveness options for uh, employees of state and local governments and not-for-profit organizations. If you can qualify under some of those other options, that may be a better choice than trying to do it through your retirement plan. Um, there's also the uh, uh, election to, uh, to, to go with a Roth um, in the event that um, uh, you're in, well, you're going to be mandated if your income is greater than 145000 that your catch-up contributions will be treated as Roth contributions. So you'll, know, you'll get no tax deferral for those. Uh, you will get uh, you know, tax relief down the road as those uh, Roth contributions and any earnings thereon are, are withdrawn. Uh, but you will no longer be able to get the uh, deferral for the catch-up contributions if you're a highly compensated employee. Uh, you also have an option, and this is something employers have to elect and permit in the plan, uh, for the employer contributions to be treated as Roth contributions. The downside of that is you have to come up with a tax uh, on those Roth contributions uh, that are made on your behalf. So if there's a significant amount of Roth contributions that go in for you and you're in the high tax bracket already, well, then um, you're going to be taxed on that additional amount as though it was comped out to you, even though it's going into the plan. Uh, so again, multiple nuances there. You, you're going to want to look at that, especially if you're the business owner and trying to set yourself up for retirement and consider whether or not that's something that you want to uh, want to look into. Um, there's also requirements to expand uh, retirement plans to long-term part-time employees. So if they've worked more than 500 hours for a number of years, chances are they're going to be able to uh, defer into your plan. They've also done some things to expand the hardship withdrawal rules. And probably the one that uh, employers will cheer most for is that they are allowing employees to self-certify the hardship. That is uh, taking the employers off the hook for playing policeman, which is a good thing, 
I'm not sure it does wonderful things for long-term retirement security, uh, allowing uh, you know folks to, to raid the, the piggy bank and basically self-certify that they have a hardship. Uh, they are also uh, raising the cash out limit for the plans from five to $7,000. So low balance uh, employees that have left uh, your employment, uh, you can mandatorily cash them out if uh, they're under a certain dollar value. In this case, $7,000 is the new limit. And that allows you to uh, simplify some things administratively by getting some of the, the smaller balance um, departed employees off of your rolls. They're also uh, looking to defer uh, the RMD uh, requirement to uh, a later age, 73, and then later 75. So that's coming through in stages. Again, some nuances there. So you're going to want to look at it. And for Roth uh, uh, purposes, uh, the RMD is going to be eliminated pre-death. So again, there's some, some changes there that um, uh, are worth looking at. Um, consider the administrative challenges that that might pose for payroll and other departments like HR and uh, decide what you're going to do. So again, there's a lot to consider here. I would certainly encourage you to look through the provisions. If you hear anything that uh, we covered in this, this quick overview that you know impacts your plan or that you have an interest in, I'd get your advisors in and, and talk through it talk through it with the departments that are going to be directly impacted as to how much of a headache it's going to be to change your systems uh, to accommodate some of this stuff. Next slide, Dan. <clears throat> They've also... Um, gone to great lengths to include special distribution provisions um, in the new law. And most of these, or quite a few of them, are employer options. So that's the good news. But it does provide for special distribution provisions that uh, exempt the employee from the 10% penalty tax on early withdrawals if you're making distributions uh, to victims of domestic abuse, uh, to folks with a terminal illness, to folks that are paying long-term care premiums and uh, want to use uh, uh, some of their retirement plan contributions for that, for qualified birth or adoption expenses, uh, for emergencies, uh, and then again, uh, to, uh, to use it for emergency savings accounts. All of this, I think, is designed to allow folks uh, to, to contribute to their retirement plans with greater confidence that the money is not out of reach if something truly disastrous happens, uh, that they might need that money. But again, these are uh, employer options as to whether you adopt these or not. In many cases, they have uh, the, the uh, employee that may take the uh, distribution has the option to repay it within a defined period of time. So there's some administrative headaches that go with tracking that. Again, it's something that you're gonna to wanna to look at because on the surface, they sound uh, very humane, very great. Uh, certainly we'll get more employees involved in the retirement process and in saving. Uh, but but may create some significant challenges for your HR and payroll departments in the process. So it'll be a, uh, a consideration that you have to look at. This is uh, an item that I threw in as a tip for those folks that are um, getting close to 70 and a half. And uh, most people can't itemize deductions anymore. At one point in our practice, I think 70 or 80% of our uh, clients itemized deductions. Uh, the uh, Tax Act passed during the Trump administration uh, raised the standard deduction to the point where most people no longer itemize. In fact, you know the number that itemize anymore are generally less than 10%. And uh, my rule of thumb is the, the folks that are itemizing are generally very philanthropic or very old and uh, infirm uh, because your state and local tax deduction is capped to 10,000 is your aging and paying off your home uh, mortgage, the interest component of that drops. Uh, your medical deductions, you don't get anything until you go over 7.5% of AGI. Um, so you're really left with basically 10,000 from state and local taxes, some mortgage interest, and philanthropy has to make up the rest. And so unless you're giving away you know, substantial amounts of money, because if we look at married filing jointly for 23, if you get 10,000 in state and local taxes, you're married filing jointly, you need 17,000 from everything else. Unless you have a really hefty mortgage and astonishing medical bills, or you're giving away a lot of money, you're not gonna get there. 
Well, one way to indulge your philanthropic uh, objectives is to consider distributions uh, directly to a charity from uh, your IRA um, to meet your required minimum distribution requirement and around the possibility that uh, that might get you where you want to be. Hey, Katie, two uh, clarification questions. One person said, can you stand on AGI? And then another person said, what does SALT stand for? State and local taxes of SALT. That's the easy one. And um, AGI is adjusted gross income. That's a line on the, the tax return after uh, certain uh, deductions and credits. That's the adjusted gross that uh, your tax is going to be uh, uh, adjusted from at some point. So it's generally your page one on the tax return comes down to AGI. But it's clearly labeled on the tax return. So for what that's worth. Hey, Kevin, on medical expenses, um, would expenses that someone pays in the continuing continuing care retirement spectrum count for that? Sort of like if you're having home care brought into your home, nursing care, personal care, things of that nature, those count? Yeah, it does. And, and that's, uh, it was kind of truncated. Uh, I it's you see it says huge when huge when people age and go into um, long-term care uh, arrangements of one sort or another when they start having challenges with activities of daily living and they're having folks that are coming in to help care for them or when they're living in congregate uh, settings either assisted living or skilled nursing care uh, continuing care retirement communities generally those uh, facilities will give you a letter that will tell you what portion of the uh, payments that you're making are considered to be for nursing and other medical care as opposed to room and board. And that number frequently is big enough that when you are in a facility like that, you will get to the itemized deduction limits. So uh, the, at the point in time where, where you or a spouse or an elderly relative go into a long-term care setting, you should start, start focusing on tracking the medical expenses much more carefully um, and generally, excuse me, generally, uh, what I would recommend is that you know who their main providers are and you ask for statements on an annual basis as opposed to trying to, to keep track of receipts. That will be a headache that will drive you nuts. But if you know that they've got uh, the facility they stay in, the pharmacy provider, their primary care physician, maybe a cardiologist or an oncologist, depending on what their ailments are, um, and, and you know who those folks are, the dentist, um, the eye, eye doctor uh, and where they get their prescriptions in about you know 10 phone calls at the end of the year, you can assemble a considerable amount of documentation to support a very significant medical deduction for, uh, for an elderly uh, person in, in uh, some sort of care setting. And that's when you do start to see the itemized deductions kick in and frequently it wipes out taxable income entirely. So that's well worth the effort of, of uh, uh, paying attention to it when the time comes. Kevin, in your anecdote, <coughs> is this something that folks typically take advantage of, or is it something that they overlook routinely? Um, they overlook some of the opportunities, and they don't have a systematic approach to gathering the data. And that's why I said I think the best thing is make the list of providers and get statements. Because if you're trying to track individual prescriptions, write checks, I mean, most of these providers now have systems that will produce this stuff. Uh, UPMC, I know, does. Uh, Highmark, I'm sure, does. We're a UPMC shop here, so I, I can't speak to the Highmark, but I got to believe their systems are every bit as good as UPMC's in that regard in terms of being able to give you what your spend has been on their products because uh, they track that in order to set premiums. So I'm pretty sure they have it and, and can provide it if you ask. All right. Thanks. Sure. Um, the, the next item I've included here is uh, Medicare Part P B premiums because uh, part of this topic was insurance. And this will give you an idea of where your uh, Part B premiums will be for uh, 2023. Uh, there is a typo in that. It says 2022 Social Security premiums. These have been adjusted to the 2023 numbers. And they're actually down a little bit, which is the good thing. Um, and the income limits have gone up a little bit. Uh, so the lower numbers available to more people, generally a good thing for those who are on Social Security. Uh, the, the thing that, that you have to be careful of here is the windfall uh, that, that might come to you from uh, 
uh, sudden wealth. And uh, I know when we had our Waynesburg office, we had a number of folks down there that uh, had oil and gas lease payments that were significant. And uh, they were overjoyed until they got their Social Security uh, statement and found out they were going to be um, hit for a lot more of uh, Part B premium dollars than they were expecting. Um, I wouldn't have given the lease payments back for the uh, savings on the Social Security if I were them, but it was still a surprise and an unpleasant one for a lot of them. So it's something to be aware of as your income rises, your Social Security Part B premium will rise as well. Retirement contribution limits have increased for 2023 and in some cases fairly significantly. Uh, the catch-up contributions for uh, Roth and regular IRA stayed the same. Uh, for SEPs, 403Bs and simples, they went up. Uh, so there's a considerable amount that you can put away if you're a, um, a self-employed profit sharing a person 66 to 73,500. The deferral portion of that is shown <coughs> uh, in the 403B Roth, 403B employee. Uh, 22.5 is the uh, deferral amount. If you're age 50 or over, it rises to 30,000. Again, if you're over 145,000, as I mentioned on that earlier slide, that catch up is another one of those uh, areas uh, that, that uh, could be a whole webinar. And so I'm going to, I guess, speak briefly about a plan if you are heading down this path. And uh, Mike and I have worked on a number of companies in the past. And uh, the first thing I would say is I've never gotten into worse shape because I talked to my attorney too early. So uh, he's generally one of my very funny. And uh, how are you going to be compensated for that? That's the second piece, which is valuing the business. And generally, there are metrics for individual businesses. With a little bit of increment homework, you can figure out what those are. Uh, for accounting firms, it's you know generally some somewhere between 0.8 and 1.25 times uh, revenues. For others, it's an EBITDA calculation. For some others, it's uh, you know so an example. We, we had a client this year that wanted to figure out what EBITDA was. Well, they were a, a C corporation and they were pushing all their money out to, to shareholders at the end of the year, so they basically had no earnings. Well, how do you measure EBITDA if you have no earnings? Well, you basically have to add back you know, owner comp and then take out a reasonable amount for the services performed. You know, my early calls are, are to Mike and uh, to my banker. Uh, you know, we have to do our own accounting and tax work. But I think you know, if you don't have any experience in the area, you may want to consider a broker or an appraiser, a valuation firm. Our firm does not do valuations. A number of my colleagues at other firms do. And I would reach out to them if I needed to get a business valuation as part of the purchase price priorities draft of documents and uh, move through a, a due diligence phase. And uh, again, that's something where I lean heavily on uh, the attorneys and then Mike in particular will give me a list of all the things that I need to, to get clearance on before I can confidently take over that business. Um, and I want to talk to my bankers and arrange financing. And uh, if I need it, I need to figure out if the business is going to function as usual and the ownership transition is smooth. And then lastly, close the deal. Um, so not a lot of tax tips there. I think the biggest tip I can give you is don't wait too long to, to call the, the uh, advisors that you're going to need. Um, as, as I said, I've never gotten into to worse shape because I talked to them too soon. So that's it for me. Unless there are questions, I'll turn it. If you have a tax preparer, talk to them and get in contact with the IRS. This will require a power of attorney. Um, and from there, you'll set up a payment plan, pay it regularly. And how much you pay is going to be based on how much you owe. It's usually a, a payment plan over a couple years. Um, if you're just by yourself, you're not reaching out uh, with a tax preparer, uh, we recommend two routes. First is to get a lawyer and hope to settle at a lower balance. Generally, the IRS will accept something rather than nothing, so they are usually willing to work with you. The second is to set up the payment plan, pay regularly, and it is possible that after a certain period of time, the IRS will just forgive the unpaid amount. I think generally we've seen after 10 years, top four, that was so important to make really and timely. All right, and some notable tax topics going around right now. Uh, first is clean energy credits. Um, the Affordable Care Act, uh, as well as other recent tax legislation, there's websites that you can go on, you can find exactly what vehicles apply. Um, you know, generally speaking, uh, they, the car manufacturers have been know, have known about this. So most of the vehicles now that are considered clean energy do apply for the credit, uh, at least the ones that are made in North America. Uh, they're energy efficient and you can get up to a $1,200 credit. Uh, this also applies for appliances and, you know, other things that you're putting in the house. Uh, so always make sure that if you're, if you're deciding to update the house, ask, ask uh, your construction worker, ask them uh, if the stuff that you're getting is clean energy and energy efficient. Recently, uh, back in December, the IRS agents funding was pulled by Congress. A lot of that funding was meant to replace a lot of the retiring IRS agents. So that being pulled, you can expect the IRS to struggle 
with getting out refunds, notices, and most importantly, taking calls. So again, that's why we said, and we emphasize, 6 p.m. and 7 a.m. tend to be your best chance of getting through to the IRS. But if you're mid-tax season, uh, it, it's going to be tough. It's, it's brutal getting through, especially with them not uh, hiring any of the replacements. Uh, crypto, uh, really important lately, is to keep an eye out for a lot of the crypto scams, especially with uh, pertains to crypto funds and stuff like that. Uh, for instance, FTX, you know, funds have failed. And again, millions of dollars being just wiped out overnight. So be we, we do say be careful when you do decide to jump in on this fad. Uh, because right now there is no protection for uh, the common person. You know, mostly the creditors are getting their money back first and the investors are not. Smishing scams are on the rise now. So a lot of message or email or anything like that, it will always be through mail. So anything else that says the IRS, just please ignore it. Uh, there's pandemic related scams. People, and you aren't seeing this as much anymore, but there's still people who are trying to collect their stimulus payments from uh the pandemic and a lot of the time they're getting their social security numbers stolen and their money taken so it's always important to keep an eye out for that and then student loans uh last we talked back in november the important date was 1 1 2023 that was supposed to be the day that student loan repayments began again however in december congress extended this once again another six months now, with re Republican control of the House, it is unlikely that this will be extended again. Therefore, the new date to keep in mind is 7-1-2023. If you are someone with student loans or have a kid with student loans, the two best things you can do is, one, reach out to your tax accountant for advisory on keeping your adjusted gross income low on your tax return, as that is the driving factor for how large your repayment amount is. The second best thing you can do is be active in your voting. Look for candidates who support reducing the income-driven repayment rate. Currently, the IDR sits at about 10 to 20%. However, there are several congressional candidates who are making a push to reduce that to 5% to ease the pain of debt and rising costs in the economy right now. And most importantly, if you or your uh, kid has student loans, apply for the student loan forgiveness. The worst they can do is say no. The best thing they can do is is forgive the loan. And, you know, some people would say, well, I don't need that money. I would tell you just apply for it anyways. Uh, the best thing you can do is to, if they're going to give out the money, is to take it. So with that, are there any questions? Dan, check out the questions in the Q&A and the chat because there are several, but I knew that you were near the end, so uh, you can check those out. Uh, if I purchase solar panels for a standalone home office shed, can I qualify for clean energy credits? Yes. In short, yes. If you uh, update your house, especially with solar panels, that one's the most significant error to discuss and figure out. I updated, my, I updated my Windows Energy Efficient prior to last year. Is it too late, too late to claim? It's not, but you're not going to get it on this return. You would have to go and amend your old return. And since it's before the most recent legislation, they'll only give you a one-time $600 credit. Second, our furnace was replaced also in early 2022, and it is energy efficient. Yes, that counts. That counts, and you can get a pretty substantial credit from that. So I would recommend uh, finding your paperwork on that, um, setting it aside, and taking that to your tax accountant uh, for them to prepare. And then this one's for Kevin. Uh, can we deduct the monthly health insurance the employer is deducting to our pay? Uh, generally, not if you take it as a pre-tax deduction because they're reducing the amount that they tax you on. So it's only if it's an after-tax deduction that you're able to, to deduct it uh, as, as part of the, the uh, um, your medical itemized deductions. Um, when you get into Medicare, the Part B premiums and Part D, if you choose to take it from your Medicare, uh, those are not being uh, handled on a pre-tax basis, so you would be able to claim those. And then we have, how long should you expect to wait on hold when you call the IRS? If you're a tax preparer, you're looking at 
somewhere between one and three hours. If you're a personal individual and not a tax preparer, you could be looking at as long as five hours or just not even getting through. So we would recommend that if you do have a tax preparer, you, you fill out the POA um, and have them do it. Uh, and as much as we love to sit on the phone with the IRS, you know, so I, I would recommend just, yeah, going, going with your tax preparer on that one. I can tell you from personal experience, it's it's very frustrating because uh, there's an auto prompt system that you go through. You have to answer a lot of questions and demonstrate that you are who you're calling about. And, and then you get to the point where you think you're finally going to talk to somebody live and they tell you there's nobody there. and You'll have to call back another time. And uh, that, no more. And, and the other experience. important thing with that is that at this point, IRS agents are trying to get off the phone as fast as possible. And so even if you do get through, if you don't have the right things, they're going to tell you you need to call back another time when you have everything organized and prepared. And they won't tell you everything you need to have. They'll just tell you what one thing is wrong and you'll go back. So again, the important thing with going with a tax preparer on that is they know what they need to have. They'll have it all organized and ready to go and they'll be able to do it in one go as opposed to four, five, six, seven chances. And, you know, you end up getting really frustrated with the IRS. And then uh, from Emma, what if we have solar panels on our home where we have our home office? Is that eligible for up to the 1200 year credit? Um, it is, but only the construction. And it's actually significantly more than the 1200 uh, a year credit. So it's the construction and the installation of the solar panels is eligible for up to 30% of the costs. And then back to the Q&A. Hey guys, quick quick question, because people may be wondering about it if you're talking to businesses that have employees. Too late to file for businesses to file for the employee retention tax credit, or is that still something that's viable for businesses? I think you still have the option to do that. If, if you are coming, you are running out of time. I wouldn't wait too much longer, but it still is an option. It is, yeah. It is an option still. Yep. So that's a bug that you want to put in your customers' ears or your own ears. If you have employees over the last several years, you might be eligible for a tax credit. So definitely you want to get with Donnelly Boland or a tax preparer to, uh, to inquire about your eligibility for that credit. Even if you got um, PPP loan, you can still get it. So that doesn't preclude you from getting it. It's, it has an impact, but it doesn't preclude you. So uh, it's, I think, something a lot of employers are sort of missing out on. All right. 